Sorry, Bonnie, I'm a little slow. All right, now we get to the, uh, the reason you're all, uh, one of the main reasons you're all here, uh, the majority, I'm sure, is our guest speaker, who can speak, uh, as we know, on an incredible variety of topics. What she's chosen to talk to us tonight about is exploring the macro world. Bonnie has, birding, has been birding for decades, as a longtime member of the MOS and the Howard County Bird Club. She's especially passionate about native sparrows or little brown jobs. I think there's something like 53 subspecies of song sparrows and she can pretty well get them all. I'm, I can know if I even do that before I'm 99. Over the years, she's broadened her interest to diversify as a master naturalist. Odinates, caterpillars, and spiders have become her main study subjects. Taking up the camera, Bonnie documents many subjects with her photos. She donates all her pictures and have been published in numerous books and magazines. My aside that I always like to offer is when I started chasing birds about four years ago, I keep running across this lady early in the morning at Rockburn Park or at Centennial, and she'd always take the time to explain things. If you listen, you could learn an incredible amount of things. If you ask, what is the secret of getting birds at this time of year, she'd just tell you to go into an orbit in the lakes. And even before I was a birder, I was at Gadelsky Center, and there's pictures on the wall by this Bonnie Ott lady who donates her photos, and they love those photos so much that they're there. So anyway, Bonnie, thank you so much, and the uh, floor is yours. Welcome. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, I normally do bird programs, but I thought what I'd do tonight is talk a little bit about things that we have mostly in Howard County. I've thrown in a few pictures from Maryland that are nearby, but of what you can see and look for when you're looking beyond birds and you're looking differently at nature around you. <clears throat> so I started birding back in the early 80s, joined the Howard Bird Club. And Joe Solom was one of my main mentors, and I was a crazy, avid lister, believe it or not. I was just passionate, running around looking for birds, had to see everything, and Joe would stop, and she'd be like, look at this flower, look at this butterfly, and I'd be like, forget it, I just have to look at birds. And so, literally, for 10 years at least, she was trying to get me to slow down, look at different things, I'd be like, no, I just have to learn the birds. So it took 20 years, but I finally <laughs> slowed down. Uh, so it did uh, take a little while, but now I've really, really become more enamored. Of course, I'm always birding, but looking for things that you wouldn't necessarily see often, or you have to learn to look differently. So this is one of my favorite photos. Uh, I know some of you, I've shown this before, might know what this is, but if you don't, you want to take a guess. This was at Merrill, uh, Middle Patuxent Environmental Area, and this is slugs mating. So this is slugs, and they're little, what the Brits would call naughty bits, and they are mating. So let me show you. Beautiful. Uh, the red button on top. Oh. It is. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is in sequence. And um, one of the things that's really cool about this, I've only seen this once in my life. You have to hold it down. Uh, there it is. Are you trying to get the technical difficulty? Trying to get this. I'm trying to go. Trying to advance. Oh, oh, we yeah. oh, hit the right button. <laughs> there we go. All right. So now, only one time, and I go out pretty much every single day looking for anything that I can find. But this was a pair of slugs, and if you're not familiar, they are hermaphrodites. So they. Both have naughty bits that they swirl together, and it's like the most amazing thing I have ever seen. Um, normally, this is something that they do overnight, and this was early in the morning. And so what's really cool about this is they look kind of like sea creatures. Oh, um, they 
spring, this is my pointer, back up into this hole. So both of those blue parts, naughty bits of the slugs, were brought back up into their body. Really, really neat. So if you ever see a slug and you want to salt it, or you're like, ooh, gross slugs, just think of this and how beautiful they were. <laughs> So this looks a lot like flan, but it's not. <laughs> These are insect eggs. So it's really cool. These are assassin bug eggs, very tiny on the upper side of a leaf. But to me, they look a little bit like flan. Uh -huh. So these are slug eggs or snail eggs. I can't tell the difference between the two, but they're beautiful little um, look like little gumdrops or jelly beans. So this is a leaf-footed bug egg. So one of the things as you start to look for macro subjects, if the birding is slow and you're like, oh, well, let me just look at some leaves and see what I can find. This is smaller than a green pea. Very, very tiny little egg, but beautiful. Now, these are another set of insect eggs with a very, very tiny parasitic wasp. So almost all eggs, caterpillars, other insects get parasitized by wasps. And so these again are very, very tiny, like about the size of a grain of rice. So you can imagine how small that wasp is and she's gonna parasitize those. <laughs> It's really cool. Another set of insect eggs, um, another set of assassin bug eggs, a different type. And some more beautiful little jeweled uh, slug eggs. So these are all things that are very abundant. You would find them in every county park in pretty good numbers, especially slug and snail eggs. But those you would only find if you start to like dig around under leaves and look under logs. They're not just out in the open. And this is a beautiful little moth in a cocoon. And it's spun, like looks like little spun glass. Um, very, very tiny. But what's really cool about this is that the um, Natural History Museum in Ontario asked if they could use this picture and they put it in their children's museum and they built a replica of that cocoon for children to be able to go into. Um, this was, um, and it has a Latin name that I can't pronounce, but this was a first county record on the Howard County or Maryland Biodiversity Bioblitz um, at the Howard County Conservancy. But again, just a really, really neat little tiny, beautiful thing. So here, going back to that flan, you're thinking, oh, it looks delicious until all these baby assassin bugs come out. But you can <laughs> see each one of these is like a little egg and then the assassin bugs have come out and they're very gregarious when they're babies. But be careful when they're older because they can give you a nasty, nasty bite. So one of my favorite things but I say that a lot. <laughs> One of my favorite things, see this right here? So these are moth eggs, very tiny, and that is a jumping spider. It is an ant mimic jumping spider. So one of the things that when I lead field trips for macro things, I was like, I have to find one of these jumping spiders. Where are they? I studied the books, I talked to people. I'm like, I can't find one. So then one day I saw my first one. I'm like, oh my gosh, no wonder I never saw it. It looks exactly like an ant and they act like ants. Once I found my first one, oh my gosh, they're everywhere. Like literally I can come out of a spring day and I've found 20 of them. So it's that learning to see and you you would not even recognize it as a spider, but I will tell you they're very friendly. So if you pick them up, they act just like jumping spiders. They'll look at you, those cute little eyes. Um, but anyway, you can just see very tiny, it looks like an ant. 
So here's A Star is Born. That's a little leaf-footed bug coming out of like that egg I showed you earlier. There it is as it's coming out. But you can see against the leaf how tiny that is. But again, these things are everywhere, but it's just taking some time to look. So each one of my subjects that I'm going to talk a little bit about, I could do an entire program just on that one group, but I'm just going to kind of go through different things that you can expect to see now that spring is coming. So another group, Katie did eggs, and they often will do them in these long lines on pieces of grass. And here's a um, maple moth that is in the process of laying her eggs. So you can go back to thinking of that picture with the little um, parasitic wasp and the ant mimic jumping spider. So if you can see, if you know the size of that moth, it gives you perspective of how tiny those other things are. But beautiful, it's like the moth that laid the golden eggs. And then these are horsefly eggs. Not many people like horseflies, <laughs> especially when you get bitten by them. But I think the eggs are just beautiful. Again, on a stem of grass. Uh, it's a big clump. So I think all of these were still. Um, again, more beautiful, beautiful eggs. There, I think somebody should design jewelry mm -hmm. around insect eggs. Mm -hmm. I'd buy it all. <laughs> and here again, so this was that rosy maple moth's eggs with the parasitic wasp. And you can see she's going to go ahead and insert her larva in there, mm -hmm. which you'll see some more of later. So moths, I love moths. This is a beautiful polyphemus moth that hatched in my house because during the winter, I will often collect the cocoons and bring them in and put them in bug catchers. So my daughter-in-law-to-be, the first time she came over, she went in the bathroom, she's like, uh, what are all these things? I said, they're spider egg sacks and things like that. And she's like, Okay, so I said, don't worry, they're not going to hatch yet. But um, anyway, I happened to, you know, just catch the moment when this one hatched out in just the most beautiful, fresh um, polyphemus moth. And then, of course, with these beautiful fake eyes. Um, another moth that, if you're lucky enough to see, imperial moths. This one had probably just hatched. This was in Patapsco Valley and was just like resting on on a leaf. Uh, another uh, giant silk moth, um, Promethea. And then if anybody, if I say anything wrong and you know better, um, correct me, because I literally probably have 10,000 names rolling around in my head. Sometimes the wrong one rolls out. Um, this one had just hatched at Rockburn. And this is a raspberry crown borer. So this is actually a moth that is a wasp mimic. So as much as it looks like a, mo a wasp, it is actually a moth. And it is all covered with dew. So one of the things that's really fun when you're doing macro photography for insects is to go out when it's really wet and dewy, because otherwise 90% of them fly away. I'm like, oh darn, missed it, because there it goes. But then with it's wet and dewy, they're pretty much stuck there until they dry off. <laughs> and a beautiful IO moth. Don't touch the caterpillars, but the moths are beautiful. So this one, I did actually kind of open the wings, didn't hurt it, so you could see those eye spots because normally those eye spots are hidden. And these are beautiful, beautiful tiny moths, very common. One of the many types of plume moths, very small. So you can see there's the wings, the body. And that's on daisy flea bane. So it gives you an idea of the size of that. Again, very common moth. And then here's a Luna, one of my favorite moths. And you can see this here where the wing has been eaten. That is exactly what it wanted. So again, with those fake eye spots, they're either to help scare a predator away or the predator is going to go for what it thinks is the eye. So it takes that and then the moth gets away. 
So if you're not aware, these giant silk moths only live for a few days. They're born without mouth parts. So they're, you know, they emerge, they fly around trying to find a mate, mate, and then die. And so they never eat during that time period. They're very short lived. So not hard to find, I mean, hard to find, and then they don't live very long. So it's really a plus when you find them. And then this is a very Latin name that I can't pronounce, but very, very tiny micro moth. And so I'm not one that does mothing with sheets and black lights. Not that I might someday when I retire, but I just go out and look for them. So again, this is um, just like the size of a grain of rice, really, really tiny, but very, very common on holly. And then this one is a super abundant, but very beautiful moth. They really like goldenrod, but it's an Atlantis webworm moth. Again, just gorgeous, gorgeous colors. And then this is really cool. This is, so there are aquatic moths and there are flightless moths. And so this is a tussock moth female. And so she's completely flightless, has no wings. So what she, here she is, and you can see this is like the old cocoon and now she's making a new cocoon. So, um, you know, just kind of like one of those interesting things that a moth would evolve to not even have any wings. And then most everybody is familiar with the sphinx, uh, the hummingbird clear wing and snowberry clear wing moths. Uh, just beautiful. They look like little flying crayfish or flying shrimps. <laughs> they do. They look a lot like bumblebees. And so this is a fun one. This is a Schlager's fruit worm moth. But what does it look like? It looks like a bird poop. And so oh that's God. it. I so there are a lot of things that mimic poop. You'll see more. Um, but it's a really good defense. You see this on the leaf, and it looks like just a little bird dropping. So anything in the world that looks like a bird dropping, I'm like, what is that? And sometimes you have to be like, uh, there it goes. <laughs> So going in now a little bit with um, chrysalis. So chrysalis are just exquisite. This is, most everyone knows, a monarch chrysalis on milkweed. A lot of times you find these farther away from the plants, though. I don't find them that often on the milkweed plants. They kind of crawl off and go to different areas. So this is one that um, is the only one I've ever found. This is Northern Curly Eye. And I found it when I was walking through the grass and there it was. And I'm like, holy moly, and took it home. And the only reason I know what it was because I hatched it and out came this beautiful Northern Curly Eye. <laughs> so, Kevin should know what this one is. This is Hackberry Emperor. So this is on Hackberry. You can see how well camouflaged these are because think of the bird coming along, something um, like chickadee, titmice, and they're like, oh my gosh, that's the mother load of food. So they want to look like they are very, very well camouflaged so they're not eaten by birds. And then this is an American lady chrysalis. Again, they're just gorgeous. And I don't find chrysalis that often, so I'm always very excited when I do find one. And then this is a cool one. This is a viceroy. So on willow, um, again, it looks somewhat like a bird dropping. And then that one, it looks like some sort of outer space spaceship. This is a uh, great spangled fritillary. Um, and this was on a sycamore. So again, a lot of this is just, I like to spend time looking at the trees, shrubs, leaves, seeing what might be different looking. And um, that's how I find most of these. Hey, Brian. Mm -hmm. so great spangled, they, they feed on violets on the ground. Mm -hmm. Will this caterpillar will walk up the sycamore? To... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so this is a red spotted purple. So red spotted purple and viceroy uh, look a lot alike. Sometimes the reason I know is because what comes out of it. So here is, you can see, 
of uh, red spotted purple that is just emerging from that chrysalis. And this was just one of those absolute luck that I happened to be there right at the time this was coming out. Mm -hmm. um, this was not, I just found this one in the wild at West Friendship Park. So this one, this is the holy grail of all chrysalis. And I can only tell you, I spent over 20 hours at Rockburn Park looking at dried beech leaves. So this is a harvester chrysalis. So this is like one of those things that I was most proud of finding because it was so hard to find. And I really was like, I'm gonna find this thing. I don't care how long it takes me. So I looked at literally probably, I don't even know, 10,000 beech leaves, but now I know what to look for. So hopefully if we have another year that we have good harvester butterflies, I'll find it, but it's very tiny. It's like the size of a little jelly bean. And you can see how well camouflaged it looks. It looks just like a little bird poop. Um, but sometimes if I get like really dedicated to find something, I just work forever till I can find it. This is a cabbage white. So this is a cabbage white chrysalis, which of course is a very common butterfly. We all are like cabbage white, cabbage white. But look at how beautiful that little chrysalis is. And I would say not something you find real often. And so adding a few butterflies into the mix for some that are butterfly lovers. I do like butterflies, but I kind of leave that expertise to other people. But a few of my favorites is the American Snout. Um, very well named, you can see because of that little snout. And then here's our harvester. So the harvester for people that maybe are not familiar is a butterfly that their caterpillar is the only carnivorous caterpillar that we have. They feed on beech blight aphids. So you can see those are the little dancing beech blight aphids. Um, and so that is where you will find the harvesters. And here's an, a harvester ovipositing on the beech leaf. And this was at Rockburn Park. So butterfly photography with a macro lens is not that easy. <laughs> they usually are like boop, flying off. So my favorite thing is to go out early in the morning when it's cold and wet and find them when they can't fly and they're all covered with dew. So um, Pearl Crescent, uh, very, very dewy, so it just couldn't even move. Great, variegated for Larry. So again, a side shot, just dewy and just beautiful in that, um, in that side shot, which is so much more subtle than when they're open and bright. Common Buckeye. So Common Buckeye, which you're very familiar with seeing that beautiful colored, big eyeballed, flat, um, open butterfly. This is from the side. Bonnie, were you photographing with artificial light? Because it was I flash. Up. Yeah, I was using flash. Mm -hmm. And then a little sachem. So there again, sachems usually can't, or at least I don't have great luck getting close to them. But when they're dewy and they can't fly, they're like little captive audience. And very familiar eastern tail blue. And then I think it's kind of nice. I think the dewy drops add like a little extra to the picture. <laughs> and going into a few just butterflies. So hair streaks are one that seems to be an easier one to approach with the macro lens. Um, gray hair streak. Banded hair streak. And again, these are butterflies that unless you spend a little time looking for them, they're very small and you wouldn't really notice them. Uh, white um hair street. And then everybody's favorite is the beautiful little green juniper hair streak. And this, um, this one is not that easy to find, but the conservancy is a good place to find them. And then coral hair streak. So, you know, out of all the butterflies, if I were to pick a Favorite, I'd say these are the sparrows of the butterfly world. Um, but hair streaks are fun. And they're just one that most people will walk right by and not even spend time looking at. So without, okay, my favorite thing, besides a few other favorites are caterpillars. 
So for those of you that don't know, I am like absolutely obsessed with caterpillars. I love them. Um, so this is called the angel, well-named because it's so beautiful. But do you see, this is the head of the caterpillar. That's the tail and see all these hairs. So beautiful, very hard to find caterpillar. I don't find too many angels, but you can see just the um, camouflage. So what is the aim of every bird to eat caterpillars? You know, they say like a chickadee needs 6,000 caterpillars to raise a brood. So caterpillars have two strategies. Either they're very well hidden or they're so bright that they're like, don't even touch me or eat me. They can be like this, hickory horn devil. So hickory horn devils are like literally the size of a banana. <laughs> Huge caterpillar. They are harmless, but really, really fun to find. They're, they're cool. Um, and uh, tulip uh, caterpillar, again, you can see the bright coloration of these. It's like, don't eat me, don't touch me, because they're fairly good size and they'd be a healthy snack. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's the head and that's the tail. What are the knobs? Just, you know, it's there's really a lot of theory on that. It's really probably just to help with being brightly colored and saying, you don't want to touch me. You don't want to eat me. GPS so this is a brown hooded owlet moth caterpillar. These are generally goldenrod specialists. And as bright as these things are, they are the dickens to find. One thing that's really cool, because they just stay on the stem in goldenrod patches, is that if you go out at night with a black light, their stripes just glow. <laughs> Okay, so when I found my first paddle dagger, this is one of the coolest caterpillars, but then I say that a lot. This is really one of the coolest caterpillars. They are gold and black, and they have these amazing paddles. Um, I've only found about five of these in my life, but just an exquisite caterpillar. Um, most people are very familiar with this. This is Viceroy, but again, another caterpillar that looks like a little bird dropping. If you go to Meadowbrook, Centennial, the Conservancy, and you look at the willows, these are pretty abundant, but they do look like little bird droppings. So this is a cool one. This one's a really common caterpillar at um, any wetland area. They like birch, and it's called a masked birch caterpillar. Now the cool thing with this, these are its little pro legs. This is a caterpillar that communicates by sound. So it actually will talk to other caterpillars by tapping those pro anal pro legs on the leaf. And um, as far as it's known from what I've read, this is the only caterpillar that uses sound to communicate to each other. And then this is a flannel moth caterpillar. This is the one that, um, didn't they jokingly use this as like a toupee for Trump's head? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it does, it does look, I know there was some Photoshop things where they stuck it on its head, but anyway, it just got a little bit. Um, but yeah, very, very dangerous caterpillar to touch. You would not want to touch this one, um, as cute as it looks to pet. <laughs> Um, and here again, now this is a red spotted purple. So red spotted purples and vice rays will look very, very similar. And um, I have to always get out the book and look because it's something with the knobs and how many little knobs they have to tell the difference. Um, another gorgeous large Cecropria moth caterpillar. So as big as these are and as obvious as they seem in these pictures, they're really not that hard to find. Um, they will blend into the branches and the trees more than it would appear from these pictures because they're kind of like draw, um, drawn out. So this is a really cool. There's a morning glory prominent and also a unicorn caterpillar that look very much like this, but this is the head and see how it's eating on the leaf. And then this is one of its humps. There's its tail, there's its legs. 
and it's amazingly camouflaged. You could look right at this, and if you did not know it was a caterpillar, your brain would not connect that it is a caterpillar. So one of the things with, um, like when I take people out on macro field trips, you're trying to teach people search images. Like once you show somebody once how something like this looks, then your brain will be like, oh, okay. And then you'll see it everywhere. Um, but amazing camouflage. And here's another one. Oh. See its head right there? And they eat on the leaf just in this pattern so that they are always blended in because they're right out in the open and think about the birds coming around looking to eat them. Um, amazing camouflage. Or they do something like this, which is a uh, um, black edge prominent. So these are pro legs and these are the cutest caterpillars when you come right up up in their faces, they start waving those pro legs around and they rear up like they're a little cobra. And so that's their defense is they're trying to scare you away. Doesn't work, but anyway, it's really cool to watch. They wave them around and they look like, um, you know, they do look a scary thing if you were small. So another thing of defense, these are such cool turbulent oscillas. And they're very gregarious and they like green briar. Um, these I found at Rockburn, but you can find them most places as long as you have green briar. That's their heads. And then that's their hind ends. So you can see they look really kind of like some sort of scary monster from the back. So if something was going to try to get them, they would get the behind and not the front. See, there we go. Isn't that, doesn't that scare you? Like, oh, let me eat you. And then this is a beautiful wood nymph. Looks just like a beautiful wood nymph. I don't know who names these things. It was probably lonely people. If they're <laughs> beautiful wood nymph. <laughs> We're a lonely person in the woods. Like. But anyway, the, the other thing is that these are often named after the moth, not the caterpillar. So sometimes what the... Um, name of the caterpillar seems weird, but the um, moth is as beautiful as well. And here's just an absolute perfect specimen of a white lace prominent. So here again, there's your head, there's the legs, and that's a little gall on the leaf, and that's how they sit. So they look, you know, to a bird, not even like something that you could eat. All right, so caterpillars go through what are called instars. So they shed and grow, and each time they change their instar, I-N-S-T-A-R. So as they grow, they can look very different in each different instar, which is great if you're trying to learn caterpillar identification, because then you got to learn like 10 million instead of just 10,000. But what is the neatest thing, this is a wavy-lined heterocampa, and they go through very, very different instars. When they're in their third instar, they grow these horns. They look just like antlers, but they only have them for that one instar, and then they disappear. Nobody knows why, and nobody knows what they're for, but when I can find one in that instar with its antlers, that's like the holy grail. <laughs> but there again, its head, its little horns, and then its little tail. So most people are familiar with spicebush swallowtail caterpillars. They're the little mimics that look like snakes. So this is a really good sized one. Again, here's its little head, and then these are its fake eye spots. Um, really, really good at scaring off predators. Um, and then that beautiful yellow moth in the beginning, that imperial moth, this is its caterpillar. But what's really cool with these caterpillars, and here again, there's its head, its little legs, it's kind of hanging upside down. They can be tomato red. They can be bright red. They can be green and all hairy. So these are all the same caterpillar, but just different kind of color forms. And here again, there's its head. So how can you not just love caterpillars? <laughs> yeah. What time of the year are you? Are you Caterpillar season is uh, September. So sadly, that coincides with sparrows. <laughs> so <laughs> September, I'm just all done in. It's it's hard. Like to split my time. 
Um, and so here's that little spice bush swallowtail doing his like, let me scare you away. <laughs> and this is the spice bush swallowtail in like one of its tiny instars. You can see initially it's like, I'm just a bird poop. And then I'm a scary snake. So you can see the difference there as it's grown. And so here he is with his little head there. And it's a really good camouflage technique. He just looks like a little dropping. But then say somebody's like, I'm going to eat you anyway. Then they have an ability. Um, they, they have little protuberances that they can shoot out that look like snake tongues. So if somebody does come to try to eat them anyway, that's their defense. And you can see there he rolled it back up in. You can see his little eye spots. And there he is. So a bird coming down, sees those eyeballs, like, I'm out of here, leaves them alone. And there he is from the side. And there, there again, there's his head. So that's just fake, fake eye spots. So I led a field trip, and people were so excited because we found this caterpillar. I've only seen three in my life. It's considered one of the more rare. This is a Harris's three spot. So these are its legs and that's its head. And then it's curled down this way. It looks just like a weird, weird dropping thing, debris. I don't even know what, but what's really cool as it sheds and it changes its instars, it keeps its old head on these little filaments there, like the head capsule, it keeps it. So like if you see one that's shed even more, it'll have two or three of its old head capsules like hanging off. Is it? So it's amazing. So, a few more caterpillars, but it's a different group. These are what are called the slug caterpillars. So slug caterpillars look nothing like slugs. They don't have anything to do with slugs other than when they move on the leaf, they glide. It's very beautiful, very beautiful. Um, so this is called a monkey slug caterpillar. I know some of you have seen these on my field trips. So this is one that is the mimicking it mimics a sh uh, shed skin of a spider. That's kind of what it looks like. See, there it is from underneath. That's its little mouth. There it is from the front, there it's eating. So the caterpillar mimics a shed skin of a spider, but the moth, when it's an adult, is a bumblebee mimic. So it's the most bizarre creature that in each category of its life, it's mimicking something else. Do not touch these. I have been stung and it's not pleasant. They're very, very powerful stingers. There he is upside down and there is his little mouth. And they will sometimes lose those legs, like somebody eats the leg off or it loses one somehow. So you find them with different legs. So here is another slug caterpillar. This is the spun glass slug caterpillar. So see how beautiful it is. It has all these gorgeous filaments. Again, those filaments can sting you. So all of these, if you see a hairy caterpillar, just don't touch it. Um, another just absolutely gorgeous slug caterpillar. This is a nascent slug, another, and look, there's its reticulating hairs. So all of these, that's their defense is that they often just sit on the top of the leaf. They're like, nobody's gonna bother me. Um, Cause once you're stung once and birds just generally leave them alone. You wouldn't touch that. Like yeah, nobody would touch that. So that's um, <clears throat> obviously another spiny oak slug. And that one is a no brainer. You're not gonna touch that thing. That is a saddleback. And they are extremely common. They, I find them everywhere. But this is its fake behind. So that's its behind end, and those are its fake eyeballs. But you can just see those hairs. No, 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 not even. Don't touch it. And there it is from the side. It's actually a very beautiful moth. It turns into a really pretty moth. 
And there's another one just for good measure. And this one, cute as a button. That's a button slug. So here again, you wouldn't even think that was a caterpillar. No. And another chagrin slug, a, lo a lovely, lovely slug caterpillar. And spiny, spiny oak, spiny oak slug. And this one's really cool. This is a skip moth caterpillar. So a lot of caterpillars, most caterpillars, get parasitized by wasps. These look, or it's believed that these are mimics of wasp cocoons or wasp, you know, parasitized um, cocoons, which I'll show you. So the thought is that that appears like it's already been parasitized so that then it's hopefully not going to get parasitized by something. But it's another way that when I show these to people, they're like, that's a caterpillar? Really cool. And very common. Um, and another little button slug. And then there's our spun glass. Who couldn't love that face? <laughs> and another staining rose. They're really, they're just exquisite. Um, and another example of a skiff. And another, because you can't get enough slug caterpillars. <laughs> and there's our monkey slug again, and you can just see all these reticulating hairs. And you can see that one, he lost some legs. <laughs> Doesn't have as many legs as the other. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry. It's okay. Should work now. All right. So what looks like a caterpillar, but not a cat that's not a caterpillar. Sawflies. So sawflies are often mistaken for caterpillars, but they're actually wasp larvae. So this is um little, it looks like what's that song from Elvis? Like it's old blue, blue suede shoes. That's what I think of. Yeah. Anyway, so they often, whoops. They often will have, um, you know, here's his head, and then they often will curve their bodies like, like little, you know, exclamation marks or S's. So you will often see people, you know, you would think that this is a caterpillar, but it's actually soft fly larva. And here's one, again, very much in a cocoon, just like the little um, moth, but this is interesting because this is a zigzag sawfly larva. So I found this um, four or five years ago in Monocacy Park, put it up on Bug Guide, had a lot of people looking at it. So this is a, a new invasive species. Um, it appears that this was the first North American record. So my claim to fame is that <laughs> I found a new invasive species. Um, but they've but there have been more reports since mine, um, but it's a very, very tiny thing, and it has a, um, unfortunate, it has a zigzag pattern when it eats a leaf, so it's one that we really don't want to see, um, but again, just one of those interesting things, because I photograph everything, even if I don't know what it is, in hopes that maybe someday I'll get the ID or someone will help me. So most people have seen these. It's the butternut woolly worm. So who doesn't love that name, butternut woolly worm? And it's another soft fly. You can see his little head there. And they put that like white fluff. It's like a nice defense, like nobody will eat it. But if you ever see black locust trees that have all this white on it, that's woolly worms. And they're very abundant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and another really cute, um, with the, a lot of younger folks will say these look like little Pokemons, but another little soft fly, I think it's dogwood soft fly. And then here they are in their typical pattern. They really do that kind of S, um, almost like defense shape. And then this one's cool, it's a slug soft fly. So again, a lot of things are called slugs when they're not, but you can see it just looks like a little slug. So going back to the parasitize, um, parasitizing on the caterpillars, the, um, a lot of different wasps are going to parasitize caterpillars, but also other 
other um, creatures as well. So if you ever come across, and people have seen these and they're terrified, these um, ichneumonidae wasps that have these immense ovipositors that look like stingers that are like six feet long. So what they'll do is they will listen and hear grubs inside tree trunks. And they take this ovipositor that comes out, it's like literally this long, and they insert it into the tree and then will parasitize the grub inside. I know it's amazing. So you can watch, like see how long this is. And then it's even longer going into the tree like a needle. And then as it pulls it out, it just wraps it back up inside its body. You can see if this is and it, really kind of cool. But um, I don't think that they could sting you, but it's really, really neat to watch as they pull that ovipositor back inside their body. So anyway, talk about camouflage. One of the most common little predators out there is the ambush bug. So there he is. See his little eye? And there's his little smiling mouth and his legs. You can see how well camouflaged that is. So butterflies that come in, moths, other insects, they just grab them because they their tactic is just to sit in plain sight. Here's one that was not too smart because he picked the wrong he picked the wrong color plant to be on, so he wasn't catching anything. Um, but they will often they can be all different colors and they just blend right in. So here's one on a daisy. There again, um, you know something coming down, flying, wouldn't see him, and you just grab him. And you can see here. Now this is. Sorry for the American copper, but see the little jumping spider there? And whenever you see a butterfly hanging or acting or seeming strange, it usually is because something has caught it. Um, see the little, oh, I'm sorry, it was an ambush bug. So there he is, and there's his head, and he caught that little American copper. And see this one? He's patterned almost just like the moth. So here's the head of the moth, its wings, body, and then that's the ambush bug right there. See how well he's camouflaged? And these things, they're everywhere. They're so common once you realize what to look for. And there's one, just a nice close up. I kind of think they look like they're smiling. You see how they have that little face? But, um, you know, just a really interesting, I mean, the macro world is just its own astonishing adventure. So going back to a little bit with the wasps and the parasitization, these are all wasp cocoons. So that's a poor little slug caterpillar that got parasitized by a wasp. And so then once they're parasitized, they're doomed. And then the little wasp cocoons are there, and then they will feed off the caterpillar. So he's kind of like a little walking zombie. Here's one that's the wasp in the process of parasitizing that caterpillar that was trying to come down to the ground. You can see there he's like inserting, I know. And so this was a group of Datonic caterpillars, and this wasp was trying to parasitize them. But what was really cool is that they're a gregarious ca caterpillar that's often in these groups. So when it would come in to sting them, they would all wiggle, like they just go crazy wiggling. So I'm not sure that the wasp was actually able to get them. But they say if we didn't have wasps to parasitize caterpillars, we would be crawl, they would be everywhere. There'd be bazillion caterpillars all over the world. So they do their part to keep that down. But here's a Shizura caterpillar. These are the wasp in the, the parasitized caterpillar. These are what they call the piglet stage of the wasp larva coming out of the caterpillar. Sorry, I didn't warn you. There's some gross stuff in this talk. And there's one where you can see the little wasp larva there. And that caterpillar is just completely almost like drained of its life. And another one. So those will go, you know, become wasps. What kind of a time period would you have from the parasitization? Something like that. 
You know, I don't really know how long it takes from that larva, the little kind of like piglet stage. I'm not quite sure. It might be different for different species too. Quite pretty quick though. Yeah. So here's one where the little crab spider really got himself a meal. Um, so a little bit about spiders, and that's kind of as we're getting towards the end. Another one where you've got the crab spider and the um, hoverfly. Again, they're a nice um, stealth predator. So little jumping spider. I'm not quite sure what he had there, but another um, another instance of tiny, tiny, very, very common, but you have to look and look in and amongst leaves and under leaves and in flowers to find them because most jumping spiders are not just out in the open. And another crab spider um, with a snipe fly, gold black snipe fly. And then this is one that's a little cob mesh spider and he got himself a fish fly. That is like a gigantic meal. <laughs> so Fiery skipper, sadly, but the spiders right there. See how well camouflaged that is? I mean, you really almost, you, the only way I find these sorts of spiders generally is that I see a prey item that looks like it had been eaten or, you know, partly caught. And then I search really carefully in the plant and that's how I find the spiders or ambush bugs. So, that's my little ant mimic jumping spider. And he has a midge. So see as much as it looks like an ant, you can see those little jumping spider eyes. And really, really, if you're ever, you know, if you're familiar with jumping spiders, they're very friendly. They're very personable. <laughs> you know, they so look at you, they're so curious. And that's exactly like these little ant mimics. So I was so excited because I got here early and I was out birding, uh, found a hermit thrush, uh, a lot of stuff out on the property here. And I found my first um, trash line or weaver of the year and it had a full web. So this is the spider. That's its head and its legs and its abdomen is this beautiful teardrop shape. So these are very tiny spiders, but very abundant. And they're called trash line orb weavers because they make like this whole line of trash from their prey items right down the center of the web. Once you recognize it, they're really easy to find. Um, but then they sit right in the center of that. So you can, I've shown people on field trips and I'm like, it's right in the center and like where? Um, but they're, they're quite small, but very abundant and really cool little spiders. I was very excited to find that one today. And then here's another beautiful little orb weaver, and this is on crane fly orchid. So crane fly orchid is one that's very common in the summer, very understated little orchid, but I'm always like happy if I can get a flower picture with an insect on it. So just like this one, another little cob mesh um, orb weaver in a um, another orchid, early spring orchid. Bye. Showy orchids. Thank, thank you. It's like too many rolling around. <laughs> um, so here's a cool uh, fishing spider, and that's on pretzel slime. So that's another one. So that's a pretzel slime mold with a fishing spider. And this is a lattice orb weaver. Very, very common spider, um, but they build these beautiful little, um, you know, shelters that they sit inside during the daytime. And that's drop dead gorgeous um, egg sac and one of the ant mimic jumping spiders. And everybody's looking at pawpaws now. Always nice when you get a nice spider inside your pawpaw tree, the <laughs> pawpaw flower. And here's a fun one. So here's your spider, and it had caught this dragonfly, and then there's this oh, head hanging down from it. There's just one of those. 
How could you resist that picture? <laughs> it's just really cool. <laughs> and then here's one I love. Spider's creepy home, I called this. So here's all the jumping spider. He was living inside this old, like, um, you know, exuvia from a centipede, probably. And so I was just like touching it and figuring, it, and then out he popped. He's like, wait, I had a great place here. <laughs> and another, so early spring ephemerals, now's the time to start looking for your really cool spring wildflowers. So this is hepatica. And this is a nice little cob mesh spider inside. And then this was one. <laughs> I was just photographing the yellow violets and talking about jumping spiders and their personality. I was like actually laying down on the ground, photographing the violet. And that little salt and pepper jumper comes up and he's just like, what are you doing? So I was like, great picture. That was one where he came to me. All right. so. I gotta tell you, for the rest of my life, for however long I live, this is my dream. And everything I'm doing from now on is about this spider. So there's a group of spiders called Mustafra spiders. They're the Bola spiders, B O L A S. They're considered very rare. So they're a bird dropping mimic. So here is the abdomen of the female spider. This is her head. Her eyes are right there. I'll show you some more pictures. These are her legs curled around in the front. So they spend the day cemented on a leaf, unmoving, no defense. Their strategy is that they look like a bird dropping. So what they do is at night, they come down to the end of the leaf and they make a bolus, I'll show you one, out of their spider silk. So it's got like a long string and then a ball on the end and they emit the pheromone of female moths. And then as the male moths fly into them, they swing that thing around, hit the moth, bring it in, wrap it up and eat it. So they don't spin webs. That's how they hunt. They're very, very hard to find. Um, and I mean very hard. So this is a male. The one and only time I found Bola spider female with males. She had three males. Um, and this is the male right there. So look at the difference between that. Um, very, very few pictures anywhere of male bola spiders, especially with the females. But there she is from the front. So see, these are her eyes. She's got these beautiful little horns. And then there she is just sitting on the leaf. Um, just the most fascinating spiders. So this is another one. So this is her little face. This is, um, the first one was called the toad-like bodice, bola spider, toad-like. This one doesn't have a common name, it's a Tamiqua. So this one um, was a first record for Maryland and there's very few records anywhere in the, country. It's a very, very rare spider. Um, I happened to find this one at West Friendship Park by sheer luck. So this is another species. This is called cornfield bola spider. So there again, there's her little face and that's her body. And you can see how she's cemented on the leaf and they hang with their abdomen down. So here's, oh, she yes. is, and she's made her bolus. And then there's the little ball and she was hunting. Um, so I did, I normally try not to tamper, but this one that I had found, I brought home and rehomed on an oak tree behind my condo. <laughs> so that way I could watch her and I was hoping she would be fine and she was, she lived the whole season. And that way is the way I could watch her hunting. So spiders have seven different types of spider silk. But the silk that Bolus make, has to make this ball is unique to just them. And so there's a lot of research looking at what it is that they can um, make that one silk that's different because it will adhere to moth scales. Because, you know, most moths can get out of spider webs. They shed their scales and go. But this one type is just um, Mustafa spiders. Can, are the only ones that can make this, and it's very unique. 
So I did take an arachnologist out because she was trying to find these spiders. And she's like, she found me, I don't know how, but she's like, Bonnie, none of us can find a bola spider. And then we found that you have, you know, so many pictures of them. I said, well, I know there's three. And she's like, oh my gosh. So I took her out and she's the first arachnologist to sequence the DNA of spider silk. And she wrote this incredible long paper, which I didn't understand any of it, but it was really nice because at the end, she's like, you know, thanks to Bonnie for helping us find the spider. <laughs> I will say, and this is always hard, she did have to collect one mm. to take to dissect it. And we talked about it because I'm like, I get very attached to these spiders, <laughs> but it was at the end of its life. So I was like, okay, I, I can understand. Um, but then there's that, like that whole wow. thing. It's just amazing. So you say it mimics the pheromone. Yeah. And they can change the pheromone throughout the night to get different species of moths. <laughs> it's just incredible. <laughs> so I know it, it's it's phenomenal. That it's like it's it's like crazy science fiction. Who even knows? But so then this one, so I've spent the last like really five years seriously looking for these. And when I mean seriously, I am very intent looking for them. And, you know, if I find one or two a year, I'm lucky. I mean, they're that rare. So anyway, um, last year before last, I found this one, which is a year Ghani's, which was a new state record. So I found four species now in Maryland, two of those were state records. So it's one of those things where if anybody wants to learn how to find Mustafa spiders, I will be happy to give you a tutorial because the more people looking for them, the better. Um, and if you find one, call me, I will come right away. Anyway, so beautiful, just like the coolest spiders. Um, so, you know, a few things that weren't bugs, but I'll talk a little bit about macro on a few other subjects where we wrap up. So this is obviously a garter snake. So there are certain snakes that I take pictures with the macro and certain snakes I don't. <laughs> and garter snakes are one of them. They're usually quite tame. So this one I just laid down on the ground in front of it. And it's like, okay. Um, fox turtle, uh, another really, you know, Believe it or not, this is a lot harder picture to get than almost anything else, because how many times do you get a box turtle to get its head back out? So how long did I lay there waiting for that? <laughs> a long time. And then finally, he's just like, OK, I'm hungry. <laughs> um, got his head back out and started to eat. Um, tree frog, uh, very easy subject to photograph if you can find them. This is why you can't find them. Do you see the frog? Mm -hmm. So there's his head, there's his back legs, and in that knot hole. So that's one of those things where, you know, perfect camouflage. And slime mold. So slime mold is another fun thing, especially if it's winter, you know, or not a lot going on birding, no insects to find. Well, you go look for slime molds. So these are fruiting bodies of slime molds. Beautiful, like undersea creatures. And then that's me. That's me. Um, I run over. I know. I was like, I was with Richard. I was like, watch the road. Don't let anybody run me over. But I was actually um, shooting a picture of a um, brown elephant, I think or Henry's elephant, one of the elephants that was down on the road there. Um, so yeah, to do a lot of macro photography, it's not always the most uh, comfortable thing to do, but um, you know, I do use the Nikon. I've gone to mirrorless now. I use the 105 macro and I usually flash most of my shots, which is just my personal preference. As you can see from a lot of my pictures, I like to kind of highlight my subject with a kind of clean background. I work really hard. That's just my personal preference with how I like my pictures to look. Everybody has a different thing. Um, but anyway, so the next day that you're out birding and the birds kind of slow down, and especially this time of year, you're like, oh, I can look for slug caterpillars <laughs> or ant mimic jumping spiders. And then all the spiders, 
hatch in May, the males hatch first, um, but you don't start finding them until probably July. July and through almost early November, you can find them. So anyway, that's uh, one of those things where if you are using iNaturalist or looking for different things, um, I know I was saying to Josh, I get published a lot and it's um, mostly people, um, what they find me on my Flickr site. I just put them up there for people to share um, for free, but usually they have to, you know, I sign releases if they're going to get published in books and things like that. But I've been contacted by a lot of people. Hey, you have like one of the only two photos of this that we've ever seen. Um, so that's kind of why I do it. I go out just like to try to document as much as I can, but it's like every day is a treasure hunt. You know, just like it is with birding, you never know what you're going to find or what you're going to see, but there's a whole nother world out there that if you just start to look differently and it really opens your awareness to seeing things um, and understanding how much is out there that is, you know, not that our brains can detect until we kind of turn that on to see that thing. So. Uh, any questions? One more sound. Any <laughs> questions? How do you get the pictures, you know, it's black in the background? It's just because of the black? A lot of times I have to isolate it so there's nothing behind it. So, for example, as um like with that little more than two lines he was on a leaf and i would kind of hold him up so that it was like open sky behind there or like a lot of area so that you know nothing would show up in the picture behind him so that's a lot of times i have to hold like a lot of the caterpillar shots i'm holding the leaf up kind of against sky so it'll black out the back behind it um, and then I'm she so that's what I I often like hold and I'm holding the camera in this hand, hence that's why I've done physical therapy. <laughs> and I'm <laughs> holding it, you know, it's just a really awkward thing, and hours and hours and hours of that. So I probably would do better if I carried a tripod, but I'd rather just hike around and not carry it. I have a question, and I don't hope this doesn't sound odd, but. If After birds, what you saw, what should be odd? Well, if, if birds are from dinosaurs, what are insects and caterpillars and spiders from? I mean, where are they? You know, that whole yeah, that you go back to that whole like you know tree of life and how everything just evolved so separately. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's just, those yeah. pictures are fascinating, and it's it, like, where does this all come from? I mean, if you look at just spiders alone, the diversity and like how different and unique they all are, it's just, it's astonishing. The things that you say are common, she can repeat it. The things you say are common, how common, not the hard ones, but the common ones. How many of them are in my backyards? Um, you know, depending on what your habitat is, that has a lot to do with it. So if you have a diverse habitat, so for example, if I'm looking at caterpillars, I'm not going to look at a single non-native tree. I'm going to look at oaks. I'm going to look at cherries. So if your yard is planted with like native oak or other, you know, oak can have just 50 plus species of things on it versus like say a Bradford pear would have nothing on it. So, you know, I I would say it, oh, this is a lot to do with your habitat. But, you know, for example, like the bola spiders I've maybe found, you know, of the the one more common species, maybe 14 of them now. And that is with like thousands of hours of looking over 10 years. So when I say rare, that's like rare, but like things like the monkey slugs and the spun glass slugs, you know, on a good day, I might find four or five of them of each species, sometimes more. So, you know, it's 
kind of like there's ambush bugs. I mean, they're every, I mean, they're literally, I could find, you know, 25 easily in a morning if I'm looking kind of specifically for it. But you kind of have to focus, you know, what you want to look on. And then of course, if it's birds and you're splitting all your attention, um, you know, it's, it's just what you're choosing to put your main focus on. Yeah, with, with, with regard to your, your question, we can follow the core dates back to almost 530 million years. The arthropods back about the same. We, you know, we've got good fossil records for those. If you want to go farther back than that, you have to use the biochemistry and, and look at the, you know, the relations of, of the actual chemistry of the DNA. Uh, and if you look at the website on the Tree of Life, that gives you a pretty good idea of, of the relationships. But the actual fossils going back over 540 million years, that gets very, very sticky because hard parts weren't invented until 540 million years. And if there's no hard parts, there's a damn poor record. Okay. <laughs> okay. That, that, Thank you. Really is. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Bonnie. <laughs> Usually we give out a coin at this point, but what, three months ago, Bonnie got her coin leading a beginner's trip at the Ramp at Centennial. I found boa spiders. I just go to Mount Pleasant and I find Bonnie and she shows me where they are. <laughs> so that's another reason to go up for birding. Butterflies next month. Thanks for coming. Come on back.